and sisters, welcome back to your new disciples journey. Um, hopefully, yes, last time you had a great session and you god is just doing great things in your heart and in your life and miracles are taking place i'm believing god for you that you are that these great things are taking place uh, today i want to talk about now that i've accepted christ um, now that i have i have received him as savior now what am i supposed to do and so for the next few sessions we're going to talk about what are some practical things that you need to do as a believer but we also want to talk about what are some, some really, what, what, is, what are some other requirements that God is saying for us to do? And to do that, we want to look at Jesus. I want to, I want to talk about, I want to explain this word, this word that you've heard me talk about, about being a new disciple. That word disciple means learner. It's the idea of an apprentice. And so what Jesus is, when Jesus told his disciple, go into all the worlds and make disciples, which you have become a new disciple, it's saying, make new learners, create new apprentices. And what are these apprentices going to be, what are they going to be learning? They're going to be learning me. He said to go and teach them the things that I have said to you. And so as a disciple, you're going to be learning the things that Jesus said. You're going to be learning the things that Jesus did, that Jesus did and you're going to follow him. Remember to what we talked about the last time, that the call, the invitation Jesus said was, was come and I will give you rest, was follow, come, follow, follow me and I will make you. And so as a new disciple, our first, this first step in this adventure after we have repented of our sins and have accepted Jesus Christ is that we're going to follow him into the next step that he's called us to. And one of the first things that Jesus did as he started his public ministry was this, what we call, and, and it's, a, it's, a, it's, it, it's what we call, there's a formal name for it, um, it's, it's the symbols of our baptism. And we... Uh, in the church, and I wanted to say for the Protestant church, I'm not going to go into talk about the different lines of church, but there is uh, the Protestant church, which are made up of most every other um, denominations or non-denominational or um, churches. And then, of course, you have the Catholic church. That's Catholic church with a C. There's a word that says Catholic, that means universal church. We're part of the universal church, which is the holy Catholic church, not a denomination, but as a believer, you've come into the holy universal church. And that's the universal church from the time of the, of the, of the first century church all the way up Every believer who believes in Christ from the past to now, even back to Abraham's day because he's our father of faith, that we are part of this Catholic church. But there is, of course, um, the Catholic church as a denomination, and then there is what we call our Protestant churches, which are every other church is under those. And most of the Protestant churches have these two specific commands that we adhere to as part of our outward sign of this commitment that we have made to Christ. Why? Because Jesus himself instituted both of these symbols. He says that as believers, that he wants us, that we are supposed to be engaged in this. The first one of those, those I want to talk to you about is the first symbol, which is called baptism. I'm going to read a scripture for you to you from Mark. Uh, Mark, uh, we actually call Mark, it's the book of Mark, it's one of the Gospels, um, but it's really Peter's account that Mark wrote off as relate of, of Jesus. And so in the book of Mark, which really reveals Jesus, the Son of Man, he's always working, he's always doing, we see, you see Jesus getting introduced in the book of Mark. In the first part of Mark, it first introduces uh, John the Baptist, who was the messenger that precursored Jesus that came and told that Jesus was coming to the first, to first century Israel. And then here comes Jesus on the scene. And in Mark chapter one, here is what Jesus is, here is what the word says. And I'm gonna begin reading from verse eight. And this is John the Baptist, who was Jesus's cousin. He says, I indeed baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. So really here, just John talking about two baptisms. There's a baptism in water and there's a baptism in the Holy Spirit. We're going to talk about the baptism in the Holy Spirit in one of our last sessions. But today we're talking about the baptism in water as one of the symbols 
of our, our salvation. It's a symbol. Baptism in water does not in itself bring us into relationship with God. Baptism in itself does not save us from the penalty of our sin. Remember what we said last time, that it's Jesus and his sacrificial death on the cross, his, the penalty of our sin that he took on as he, when he was crucified and paid the price of our eternal, uh, the penalty of our eternal sin, that he paid that price and we accepting him as repenting of our sins, as believing that God raised him from the dead, confessed within our mouth and receiving him. That is what brings us in, gives us new birth and we become born again and we become the children of God. But baptism is a symbol that was instituted by Jesus as an example. So here we see in Mark where Jesus starts his public ministry, uh, Paul, I'm sorry, John talks about the two baptisms, the baptism in water, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And then in verse 9 it says, in Mark chapter 1, it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And immediately coming up from the water, he saw the heavens parting and the Spirit descending upon him like a dove. Then a voice came from heaven that says, You are my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. You guys remember that scripture from last time. So here we see Jesus being baptized by John. And as he is baptized, we see him coming out of the water. So this is a literally an immersion in water that John baptized Jesus. Now, when we look at Matthew, we're going to go to Matthew chapter 28, verse, beginning at verse 18. Now, Jesus has been crucified, he has been raised from the dead, and he's about to be, he's, ab he's about to ascend to heaven. And these are, the, these are one of the last words that he says to the disciples as he's leaving. And this is in Matthew chapter 28. Matthew was one of Jesus' disciples. So this is a book written by him. And so in verses 8 through 20, here's what Jesus says in verse 18 through 20, of chapter 28 of Matthew. He says, All authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. So when Jesus died for our sins, the scripture says that he went into hell. He took from Satan the keys of death and hell. And so Jesus now reigns. He has authority over heaven and earth. He reigns. And he says, since I have authority... He's saying to the disciples, and that means us as well, not just the disciples in the first century, but disciples through all the ages. This is Jesus' command to us. He says, go therefore, why go therefore? Because I have authority, you now have the authority to go and make disciples, which is what we're doing right now, and you receive making disciples of all nations. That's all nations. That's blacks, that's whites, that's Africans, that's uh, Hindus, that's Indians, that's Chinese, that's Canadian. He said all nations, every tribe, every nation. He said, you're going to go and you're going to make disciples, make apprentices, make learners for me. And here's what the key, baptizing them, baptizing them. He says, you are going to baptize them. So he's talking about water baptism, right? He says, you're going to baptize them. Because remember when we looked at Mark, we talked about, John talked about two baptism. He talked about the baptism in water, which he did as a human being. He baptized in water. And so he says as disciples that we are going to baptize these disciples in water. But the other baptism is a baptism of the Holy Spirit that Jesus will baptize us with the Holy Spirit. So that's not what we're talking about here. We're not talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which this when Jesus is talking here. He's saying that you have to go. You are going to be discipling them, making them become apprentices, making them become learners of me, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And so Jesus commands us as disciples that we are as disciples, not only are we to baptize new disciples, but new disciples are to be baptized. It's a command. 
So God commands us, once you've received Christ, once you have committed to be a follower of him, once you have received him as Savior, he commands you that I want you to follow my example. I was baptized by John. I was fully immersed. And now I'm commanding you as you, as a disciple, as a, that you must be baptized. So the, the, we're asked, Margaret, what's the next thing? Your next thing is that you want to become baptized. And remember, I want you to understand, baptism does not get you to, the, to heaven. Jesus does. Baptism does not help you walk into this kingdom on earth or establish. Baptism does not save you from sin. Jesus does. But what baptism says is that I am going to be obedient as an apprentice, as a disciple of Jesus, to emulate him because he was baptized in water. I'm going to be baptized in water. So I follow the example set by Jesus that I'm going to be baptized. One, because he, di he did it. Two, because he commanded it. We see in Mark, he did it. So an, what an apprentice does, an apprentice does what he sees his master doing. And so as a disciple, as a learner, as an apprentice, you're going to follow and do just like your master Jesus did. So he, we're doing it because he did it. So we're following him because he's our master. He's our Lord because we've admitted that. But then we're also doing it, secondly, because he commanded it in Matthew chapter 28. And so it demonstrates, I love to call baptism, it's an outward sign of an inner word. It's your coming out party. Because it is saying to the world, it's saying to the demons in hell, it's saying to your friends, it's saying to your new family, that I have made a decision to follow Jesus Christ. I repented of my sins, and I have come to faith in Christ. I remember my baptism. It, it happened um, probably about six or seven months after I received Jesus Christ, and I was born again. And I went through what you're doing through now, a new, we call the new believers, or new disciples class. And I was so nervous. I had this long white gown on, um, and I had to give my testimony about how I came to faith in Christ and how I became born again. And I was so nervous. But guess what? Everybody else in that sanctuary, they actually did the same thing. They confessed their sins. They followed Jesus and baptized. These were my brothers and sisters, and they were there to cheer me on. And that's the same thing that's going to happen with, to you. As you commit to becoming, following Jesus in baptism, one, because he did it, two, because he, commit, he commands us to do, but three, it is your part. It's a great time that you can share with family and friends to come in the sanctuary and that you are, you are baptized in water. It's your birth. It's your coming out party as you share with the world that you have become that you have become baptized and we see people doing it in acts 18 and 8 it says many of the people who heard him jesus believed and were baptized we see baptism happening with the first church and so jesus did it jesus commands it and we see the community of believers doing it and so your first step is that you'll be baptized so wherever church that you are part of you're not part of a local church we're going to pray we're going to talk about why it's important to be part of the new family in a little bit in in, in another session um, but the next step that you will take is to be baptized and baptized is about the idea in baptism it's the same way where Jesus went, remember we talked about he came out of the water, so he first went down in the water, and it's a symbol that I am united with Christ in death, and then when we're raised up, that I'm raised up with him in life. And so it is just a symbol. It is just a symbol. It is just a us following Christ in back to that says, because he died for my sins, he was buried and he rose again, and I am also buried with him, and I rise with him. This is Colossians 2, verse 12. Colossians 2 verse, says, verse 2, verse 12 says, For when you were baptized, you were buried with Christ, and in baptism you were also raised with Christ. And so God would command you that you, your next step is that you would do baptism. Baptism says, this is my sign of my full commitment. I'm going all out. I'm fully committed. And I'm letting everybody know. 
the demons, everybody, but especially God, that I'm committed to following him. And we're doing it in baptism. And so as you become part of a local assembly, as you go into your baptized, they will have specific guidelines on how they will do that in, their, in your church. You want to also make that, um, you, want, you want to follow being obedient to the church to be baptized. But I'm saying to you that you, that as a believer, God has commanded you to be baptized. So long as you are a believer, you are baptized. So the second, the second um, symbol of our, um, of, of, of our commitment to Jesus Christ is what we call, and you guys have probably heard it, it's communion. Communion was instituted by Jesus Christ on the night that he was betrayed. It was called, so other people called it the Lord's Supper. So this was the last supper, this was done at Passover, the last meal that Jesus had um, with his disciples before he was crucified. And so Jesus himself instituted this symbol that he invites and he shares, he actually commands that as believers that we should do. So these are the two visible symbols of, um, of, our, of our commitment to Jesus Christ that the Protestant church has right, which is very different from the Catholic Church that, might, that has, I believe, seven. But in the Protestant Church, we, these are the only two symbols that we know Jesus himself, that Jesus himself instituted. So look, let's look at baptism. What is the Lord's Supper? So let's look, at, let's look at it like we're hanging out with Jesus. Because we're his disciple, let's go hang out with him and his disciples and kind of see what they did. And so as a, an apprentice, it's important that I need to see, well, what, what is this thing? What, what does this mean? What, do I, what, 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 is this, what did that do? So I want you to think in your mind, to then kind of transport yourself to first century Palestine, and you uh, have uh, uh, stumbled in to the upper room, and there is Jesus, and there is his disciples. Um, most says it's 12. There's probably more than 12 that were there. And here is Jesus in Matthew chapter 26. And we're going to, um, and we're going to, we're going to begin at uh, verse 18. And this is Jesus speaking to his disciples, going to the city, to a certain man and say to him, the teacher says, my time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. So it is a time of Passover, which is a Jewish holiday, a Jewish festival that commemorates the time when God brought out the Israelites out of Egypt and he instituted the Passover, the Passover lab, that, that Passover meant that God was going to, that God was going to pass over the Israelites, that he was not going to see the sin, but because of the blood that was placed on the Lord, he, their door, he would pass over. This is a symbol of what, of Jesus in his coming. And so that Passover lamb back then represented Jesus Christ as our Passover lamb. Because remember we talked about, about the great exchange, that he who knew no sin became sin for us. And so that we, because of the blood of Jesus, that's now planted in our heart, God passes over us. And so we don't have to pay the penalty of our sin. It's a great Passover. So now here is Jesus. He is now at the Passover. He's about to be the lamb that was slain for the entire world on the pa Passover, uh, at the Passover time. And so he says, Bring, send them into my, uh, 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 and your house with disciples. I want to, to celebrate Passover. And verse 19 says, so the disciples did as Jesus had directed them, and they prepared the Passover. And the evening came, and he sat down with the twelve. Remember, you're peeking into this. You're sitting there as one of the disciples. You're peeking in. And here, as they're eating, Jesus says, assuredly, I say to you, one of you will be, betray me. So in the midst of Passover, Jesus is betrayed. And as and he's he betrayed, it's revealed that Judas, one of his disciples, is the one who is going to be betraying him. And so here in verse 26, it says, as they were eating, Jesus took the bread and he blessed it. He broke it, gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. And then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them saying, drink from it all of you. For this, listen very carefully, for this is my blood 
of the new covenant. So what Jesus is saying is that my blood is establishing a new covenant, a new promise between God and man. That there was an old covenant that was instituted at Sinai. There was an old covenant that was instituted with that blood that was on that post that was passed over. But now Jesus said, I am the new lamb. I am the new, I've established a new covenant in my blood. That I am the one that's going to be able to have the, the penalty of sin be passed over from you. That you need to eat of it. Because in this new covenant, which is shed for, the, for many for the remission of sin, and so his blood was, set to re, was shed to remit sin. He says, but I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine now until the day after I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. So he's saying, this is the covenant is in my blood. And Mark, he says here, so it must be, it's a covenant that God instituted. And he says, as believers, we must be a part of that covenant. And then Paul, who was one of the, the, most, the, the one who wrote the letters in the New Testament, most of them, here's Paul now. He's now reaffirming this covenant of Passover in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Remember, we talked about it is about being a disciple who follows. He said, I receive of the Lord that which I give to you. On the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took the bread and he broke it and said, this is my body that was broken for you. In the same manner, he took the cup. Again, he gave thanks and, and thanks. And he said, drink of it, all of you. This is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you will in remembrance of me. So Jesus says to us as disciples, you are your, the ordinance, this covenant of, the, of my broken body, symbolized by the bread, of my shed blood, seated, um, symbolized by the wine. Do this as often as you will. So he's saying, whenever you feel like doing it, do it. Whether you do it once a month, or whether you do it every day, or do, it, do it as often as you will. Why? Not just to do it. As a remembrance of what I've done, a remembrance of the covenants. And so as believers, God, Jesus instituted this, this covenant, this symbol that we take as often. So it is a simple act. It is a reminder of Jesus and his shed blood. It's a symbol of his broken body and shed blood. We take, it's a statement of our faith. Every time we take the bread and the, and the wine, we're, we are establishing, we're saying, I believe that Jesus died for me. And how often should I do it? As often as you will in the presence of your body of believers. It's a communion. It's done in community. Because it's, it's the body of Christ coming together to celebrate. So when we talk about it, how should I do it? Scriptures, uh, the first Corinthians talk about, it says, therefore, whosoever eats the bread of the, and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. A person ought to examine himself before he eats the bread and drinks the wine. So as you do that second symbol, you want to, you're going to pray, you're going to examine yourself and see if there's anything between you and somebody else. You want to ask forgiveness, you want to go to them, ask forgiveness, ask the Lord for forgiveness. If there's unconfessed sin between you and the Lord, you want to confess that sin before you take, you take that symbol of blood, I'm sorry, of Christ's blood and his bread. This is very serious. Do not, if you feel convicted, do not take the Lord's, what we call the Lord's Supper, if, you, if there is unconfessed sin between you and the Lord or you or someone else, it says it very clear. So you must have self-examination. 1 Corinthians eleven seven. 7. Confess your sins, 1 John 1, 9. Recommit yourself back to God, Romans 12, 1. And restore any broken relationships. And then you're free to take that second symbol of salvation, the Lord's Supper. And so it's important, as, you're, as you are talking about how, what's the next step, we want to be baptized in water. What's the next step? You don't have to wait for baptism to take communion. So long as you hear most churches where you're going to, so long as you have confessed Christ Jesus as Lord. Now, some people do say baptism, but you don't really have to. You, what, what's important is that there is no unconfessed sin in your life to the Lord. You have restored, your broken relations have restored, and you are free to take the second symbol of your 
commitment to Christ and your relationship with him. So I encourage you, if you have not been a part of a church yet, pray. We're going to pray and talk about how you do that. But you, we want to, by the time you get, you get that you are beginning the steps to baptism and you are celebrating Lord's Supper, Supper within a church that knows Jesus Christ, let me pray for you. So Father, I thank you for your uh, people, for your new disciples, as they begin to engage in these two symbols of their faith, in baptism and in taking of the Lord's Supper in remembrance of what you've done for them. I pray, God, that as you said, it's by your stripes that we're healed. I pray that healing will occur. I pray grace will occur. I pray deliverance will occur as they partake of this great remembrance of what you've done on the cross. In Jesus' name, amen.